Today we are going to be reading Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, so you don't have to. This truly is one of the greatest books I've ever read. I mean, the whole Insert Those series I have here, this man was quite literally my mentor. Before we start, a quick little backstory was when I was about 19, 20 years old, I dropped out of college, I dropped out of the public schooling, and I picked up this book first. And it was the most enlightening thing I have ever read. And here now today, just about four years later, I'm 22 years old, my company's public on the NASDAQ, I am financially free, and I truly owe a lot of it to the clarity that was given to me by this offer through this series. And I think this is the greatest way to start. I truly believe that noise the sift of what information on the internet will actually get you closer to your goals is the biggest issue in the world. It's what's holding and oppressing a majority of people who are trying to be free, trying to take that next step in their life back because there's too much stuff to really see clearly. And this will allow us to see clearly. It will, you'll use this information for the rest of your life. I'm rather excited. I have read this once, of course, like three, four years ago. So I am excited to open it back up. As always, I appreciate the support. Truly, you are an assassin if you're here right now. Not many are putting in the work you are right now. So let us get straight into it. Of course, I'll be back every time I see something of utmost value. Here we begin, page one. Already, he says his book is about luck being perceived as non-luck. And so a lot of the time, which the title makes quite clear, People are trying to market you some sort of skill set in which they have gotten rich, right? And they kind of paint it as if they got rich purely because of these actions they took, which they will now sell to you. And so what he's going to do here is allow us to see through this facade that the 99% pulls over the 99% in regards of marketing their product and how you truly get a step higher rather than, you know, being told that it's this, 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 or some sort of luck. He's already connected the idea of us back in the day as primitive tribesmen where we would scratch our nose and then rain would fall. And all of a sudden the whole tribe has this conclusion that if you scratch your nose in the right way, right, the gods will bring us rain. And he ties it to somehow that a Federal Reserve rate cut leads to economic prosperity when really there's much deeper, deeper sense to what is truly happening inside of these complex systems, but the human mind is extremely prone to building false narratives around insignificant sums of data. He goes on with another example, which I know Taleb has much against is economists, especially economic risk takers, how he says, that they are much closer to delusion or down a labyrinth of noise than they are of actually tangibly doing anything. He says that a lot of the math, the probability and such is uh, much more used on a theoretical level to go deeply into you know, probabilities just to go deeply into probabilities rather than actually apply them in reality to get some form of gain. Now he already starts coming at traders, which I spent a lot of my life trading options and so did Taleb. I'll be sure to parallel everything trading wise over because trading is a nice foundation of understanding. It's very clear and blatant to see these things inside of the market because it's liquid and there's actually money moving. But these false narratives, for instance, a trader who wins 99% of the time, they don't quite comprehend that uh, the risk reward is very similar or they only win 99% of the time, not because they can predict the future, but purely because their position allows them to do so. They have quite literally much more to risk than they have to gain. And so I'll be sure to parallel it to a more simple state so we can really see through the noise and not really get fooled by randomness. But you could see how big of an issue this is when it comes to especially like the trading game, social media trading, all these guys telling you you can make money off of Forex you need to be able to interpret data. Because if I want a 99% win strategy in trading, I quite literally can just create one. Like I could do that today, right now. But understand that it's not exactly worth it in the end if you truly understand how reality functions. 
he says the human mind is not equipped with the skills to really be perspicacious or to see through what lies on the surface. Uh, an example would be every time I see a fire, I see a fire truck. Fire trucks cause fires. Right? Clearly that's not the case, but after you watch this video through, you'll start to see that we are making conclusions just like that in nearly every other walk of life. And he says that sadly the human is not uh, equipped naturally with the ability to see through this surface level facade, um, but that's only really a problem to the guys at the top of academia or the guys that lack the humility to understand that there is a problem and learn around this problem. And so understanding this will give us an edge, a position better than the rest in quite literally the rest of reality as we live it through. So he says he will first start this book by explaining um, how we interpret unprobable events and build false narratives about the randomness. Then he's going to talk about uh, a bit of rare events and how these events function, which he basically called the financial crisis here inside of this book that is oh so famous. And then he's going to give us rules of thumb, heuristics to help navigate these disastrous waters better than most. He goes on giving some examples of this fooled by randomness problem with some uh, like older Greek stories, but this Yogi Berra quote puts it very well, it ain't over until it's over. And he sums it up very, very clearly that it doesn't matter how frequently something succeeds if failure is too costly to bear. I know that Taleb himself uses the analogy of picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. A lot of situations in life, you can be picking up pennies in front of a steamroller and it's not gonna be worth getting those pennies if the steamroller inevitably comes and knocks you over. Another example of this is the turkey, where the turkey wakes up and he gets fed every single day and so he sees his owner and well, that owner feeds him. And so as far as he can see backwards in his own life, right, projecting out the future possibilities based on history, which is an issue, He's going to get fed by his owner. So he gets fed, he gets fed, he gets fed, and then psh, one day it's Thanksgiving and the turkey gets slaughtered, right? How much was all that food worth when inevitably you're going to get slaughtered, right? So again there, he says, it does not matter how frequently something succeeds if failure is too costly to bear. So now he's getting into a story of a man he calls Nero, building a false narrative about insignificant what he sees in the real world. He's in Chicago and he sees some trader in a nice car driving a parking garage and he decides that trading must be the way of life. I know that Taleb thought the same way. I know that I thought the same way. I know that millions of other people thought this exact same way. And so we'll see how it begins to unfold. He even shows some fooled by randomness by saying, Nero has come to the conclusion that trading must be the most exciting means of life. He says, although he hasn't tried being a pirate or overseas piracy, uh, he still concludes that trading must be <laughs> the most entertaining method of life. The story goes on to follow Nero as he climbs the ranks of being a Wall Street trader and then he finally makes it to the top um, floor where basically he's a quantitative financial product specialist. And you'll see as he emphasizes many times over Taleb that more math doesn't always equal more results. In fact, it can lead to harmful conclusions. He describes Nero, which I've come to realize is himself. He's describing himself here as Nero. That he has an allergy to business talk like bottom line, this is the game plan, how we get from here to there. And Nero ends up becoming, or Taleb even, uh, a propri proprietary trader, which basically means that he has a fund that gives him an allocated sum of capital, and what he's going to do is get to trade it with the freedom uh, that he wishes, which is a very, very ideal um, situation. Prop firm kids, listen up. <laughs> 
He explains that he had a year in 1993 where all the other traders outperformed Nero and this made him discouraged and so he had to find a new job at a new proprietary firm because all these other traders were outperforming him. He also emphasizes Nero's mindset where when he makes money he throws it directly into a savings account. That redundancy if you will, keep that in mind. And then he says the years go on and all the other traders who were once outperforming Nero, they all blew up their accounts in the uh, 1994 Oh, actually, the 1993 um, bond market crash. So notice that. Nero made a little bit less capital, but he also dodged the extreme downside risk of the bond market flushing. He explains that Nero has seen many traders blow up, and he does not want that to be his reality. Every time he has an extreme risk to the downside, he considers the boring halls of university, and he says that he focuses, rather than grabbing profits, he focuses on reducing his downside risk. goes on to explain that Nero loves taking small losses. Now this is a deep, deep theme that Taleb just bangs on over and over again that is extremely clear here. What is your risk to reward ratio? It does not matter if you win every single day if the downside risk is too much to bear, as we said moments ago. So I'm going to read through this story um, because I think we got the key, key um, themes already tied up. So he's just laid the framework of a character called Nero, which I've come to realize is quite literally him. Nero's perspective is rather than grabbing at the profits, he reduces his downside risk. He'd rather take small losses in the market on a consistent basis and make sure that his winners are massive rather than being prone to some severe unprobable event, which he terms blowing up an account. And by blowing up an account, he means uh, losing more money than anyone ever expected um, him to lose, which would inevitably put him out of business. No one ever is in a position where they expect to go out of business until the unthinkable black swan event happens. And now he's going to compare this position that Nero had, where Nero is now uh, comfortably free. He has millions of dollars in short-term treasury debt, extremely secure position where no matter what takes place in the market, Nero makes sure that he's in a position to benefit and gain from it. So now Taleb's going to compare him to um, a trader he terms John the high yield trader. And I guarantee you that this is going to be the other side of the spectrum. He says the only dark part of being a trader is the sight of money being showered on unprepared people. We often say that the worst thing you could do when you get into options trading, any trading, or really any business, I did it, I think a lot of other successful people went through this cycle, the worst thing you could do is make like hundreds or millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars extremely quickly because you don't know what to do with it, right? And well, easy come, easy go. And it can lead people down extremely gruesome paths. I mean, I've seen it in my life of running asset entities. There's been people that have come and they have kind of withered off into these uh, not so morally sound avenues of business because quite literally greed, right? There's a lot of quick money there. And it's an interesting, interesting thing over the last six years watching those individuals get that quick money and seeing how they deal with it because 99% of the time it's not the prettiest sight. Now he's emphasizing the struggles of the rational secure trader Nero in comparison to high yield trading John where John has the two Mercedes, he has the big mansion that kept getting bigger and Nero knew what he was doing over here was correct and rational and best but it was hard to still act on these actions he knew were best while he's watching someone else is doing quite literally the opposite continue to succeed and succeed to ever new heights. He said he felt, or his wife said that she felt forced into sort of like a competitive life where they're competing with the other individuals, although they knew deep down that that was not how they should look at life. He goes on to question his own thoughts and perhaps 
He should have been involved in the high yield business rather than looking at technical papers and thinking as hard as he did about things. And that way he may have ended up shining among those shallow thinkers like John, the high yield trader. And a deep, deep theme, the difference between Nero and John, which I'll simplify for you, is that Nero taking the small risk, or small risk, high reward positions where he's consistently losing a small sum every day, but when the massive opportunity presents himself, he's not at harm. In fact, he's at a position to make a lot of money off of it. Right? It's backwards in the psychology, but the whole entire game is that if you were to map out their position, Nero's position is always with very, very little downside risk, but relatively massive upside reward potential. Whereas John on the other side is the complete opposite where he has extreme, extreme downside risk, but very, very small reward potential. And what separates them is John wins 99% of the time, Nero wins 1% of the time. The secret is that the money isn't winning 1% of the time because that's what blows up this guy's account. That's where things get disproportionate or they lose the equilibrium, but we won't get too complicated yet. Oh, he emphasizes that even Nero's own losses are limited. Even if everything money-wise went to shit, Nero, he still has his books, he still has his walks in the park, he still has nature, whereas everything that John has, his Mercedes, his mansion, right, that would on a personal level still be losable, whereas no one can take Nero's books, no one can take nature from Nero, right? Even in a realistic philosophical sense, not only financially, Nero is in a robust position that, right, because he has his downside kept. It's just beautiful. I love this man to live. And here we have it. Finally, in September 1998, Nero was vindicated. He says one morning he was leaving to work and he saw the guy John who was no longer in his business suit but instead John was in his front yard smoking a cigarette. And it finally happened John had lost everything that he had and he was fired and Nero feels guilty I guess about uh, feeling joyous in that moment that the reality had taken place. So that Nero felt extremely proud of sticking to his strategy for such a long time, even though everyone else was telling him otherwise. And he realized the joyousness was because his methods, his beliefs had now gained credibility because the downside risk of whatever crisis may take place, they could never happen to him. And again, Nero is definitely Taleb. Now he goes in to dive in the perspectives, the difference between the high yield John guy and Nero. He touches on leadership, that leadership is much more about the impression, the facade an individual can build around himself and his actions than the true underlying function of those actions. I mean, you see it massively with social media that people aren't following who's going to help them best. People are following who makes it seem like they would help them the best, right? He says that the very fact that he did not experience John's success, the high yield, low risk, probable reward, or high risk, probable reward trader, um, the very fact that he did not receive his success is the very same fact that he did not go bust when John went bust. He says that from this position alone where John had much more to lose than he had for reward, right? high yield, probably selling naked options where you have a 90% plus chance of winning. If he had li lived his life over a million times, it would become very clear that this was not a, a circumstance of bad luck, but instead more so a circumstance of reality and how reality functions. Now he compares two new characters, John Doe A and John Doe B, where John Doe A won the lottery and has now moved into this neighborhood, whereas his neighbor, John Doe B, lives a very uh, meticulous, normal, consistent lifestyle where he's a dentist. And now if you were to go over both of these people's lives a million times, you would see that 
B, the dentist, would uh, live a consistent, pretty narrow reality through a million trials. He would be the dentist and make that money no matter really what happened. Whereas John A, who won the lottery, you would see him uh, being a janitor and spending millions or hundreds of dollars on lottery tickets every month, right? 99% of the time, this guy's not actually going to hit it, whereas this guy has a pretty consistent stable path. And you see this in reality and content creation all over, right? These guys, especially the crypto kids, like a lot of people made a lot of money on crypto because they bought a coin. They fell in, uh, they went over into a na narrative and built exposure off it. And now they're building these narratives in the crypto game that they got rich because they understand crypto to some extreme extent, when in reality, they just happen to be in that position in the right spot. And so what he's going to basically do is help us separate those two so we don't get caught up in these uh, delusional narratives um, and can kind of build a consistent reality for us. I mean, this really is what a lot of the community is about. But again, the human mind is not perfectly wired to see things this perspicaciously, uh, right? We want to just kind of follow the sheep, or at least the normal individual does. But the reality is that's not going to increase the probability of you living the life that you want to. He explains a concept called an alternative history, where he says that we cannot judge a performance in any given field, whether it's finance, politics, medicine. Um, we can't judge it by the results, but by the cost of the alternative. Alternative. And he gives a fine example of how this plays out uh, with an example of a Russian roulette game. Where let's say some Russian mobster uh, gave you the opportunity to play Russian roulette, which is a game where you load a game you never want to play, a disgusting thing, where you load one bullet uh, into a gun and right spin it. Right? It's Russian roulette. And so you pull the trigger. If you don't die, you get $10 million. Uh, you're, you know, it's not worth the risk. Um, even though, let's say, somebody played that game and they pulled the trigger and there wasn't a bullet in that single chamber and they didn't die, right now it's like they're going around saying, hey, this game works and we make money doing this, playing this game. But the reality is that considering the alternative uh, events that could take place in that game, the risk of the alternative realities, that game is nowhere near uh, worth uh, playing. And so that's basically the same thing as selling naked calls where you have a 90% chance that you're going to win. Uh, but if you do lose that 10% of the time, you're going to lose an extremely significant sum. And so just because you win three times in a row, you don't want to build this narrative that those actions are proper right actions without looking deeper. The roulette playing fools will inevitably um, come to the reality of the situation. And so he says that the $10 million made through playing Russian roulette or even buying shit coins, <laughs> cryptocurrencies, right? In my example, it's not nearly as valuable as the $10 million that um, the man made through dentistry, right? Purely because of the potential for the alternative events that crypto going to zero, you blowing your brains out, or, you know, uh, the reality that being a dentist is pretty stable, consistent. Um, you know, way to move forward. And then he goes on to emphasize that in reality, it is much different than the Russian roulette game where anyone can really figure out uh, the alternative realities of that Russian roulette game if they can just divide by six. Whereas in the real world, it is extremely much, much, much harder to see and comprehend those alternative realities. And so the flip side of that is, let's say you were selling some form of insurance, whether it be in the market or in real life. If you go 10 or five years and no crazy event has happened in the market, you didn't get hit by a falling door off the third balcony, right? A lot of people will go back to the individual selling them the insurance and say, hey, you wasted my money. Nothing bad has happened. But in reality, it is a much deeper, important theme to comprehend that it is not... Um, the case that you wasted money because when the bad unthinkable event happens you will see quite clearly that your money was being extremely well spent on that insurance
Now he's beginning to emphasize the difference between a theorist and a practitioner or academia smarts versus street smarts and how people would come in as traders to Wall Street while he was there and they had all these Russian physicists, all these chess specialists. They put chess on their resume because it sounded strategic and smart. But he's emphasizing how seriously concerning um, spending an extreme amount of your time in theory doing all this math, building this reality that isn't coming from reality, but rather a textbook and some professor. Now he starts telling stories of other traders who were basically the high yield John in this scenario where they were all doing great and they kind of talked him down and then it's come to a point where after some significant events they are now out of business and pursuing other matters. He even gives an example of someone who started to listen to him about the risk situation, about the downside risk and he started focusing on, uh, which you'll see, uh, we'll talk about shortly here I assume that it's not really even worth thinking about it, what is, could happen, like trying to paint out that he says before 2001, far before September 2001, uh, his buddy was talking about a plane crashing into their office building and what they were gonna do about that, um, which is just a wild story. But the emphasis is that it, the unthinkable event, the one that will be severe, the downside risk that we should be concerned about is the one that we won't be able to think about, right? Because that is gonna be the one that wrecks everybody else uh, unless we maintain as Nero and Taleb in a position of significant asymmetry. What you'll see is that I continuously get up and pause the camera and start recording again, which aligns with literally everything we've talked about thus far. If I sat here and recorded me reading this whole book for two hours, three hours, probably take me four or five hours to be honest. Um, there's a lot of risk in losing that file, but if I come over there every 30 minutes and just stop the camera, then I'm now reducing my risk, right? That's the same thing that we're talking about here in regards of asymmetry. But we're about to shift into some uh, some other concepts shortly here, I assume. Taleb here talks a lot about him being in academia and him talking about these ideas and a lot of smart, high rank people spending time asking him questions that are of no significance whatsoever. And I think what he showed me as a young lad trying to navigate these waters of gain or alpha as we call, in the, call it in the community is figuring out what is truly tangibly going to move the needle and what is truly worth comprehending is so damn valuable it is insane. These guys in academia especially they will spend their whole lives looking at a single leaf of the tree when in reality in order to live the best life you must take a step back and be willing to take a look at the entirety of the tree i mean people spend so much time in the leaves and the branches i don't even think it's worth looking at them we've all spent more than enough time looking at the leaves and the branches i highly suggest you crawl through them don't even look at them until you get to the roots because once you understand the roots the trunk of reality you will intrinsically comprehend each leaf and each branch in itself. You'll start to see it in reality, just like that example I gave you of me stopping this camera every 30 minutes so I don't take too much risk in sitting here for four hours and reading the book. Now he's emphasizing that communicating this problem of alternative history is really the idea that it's not about a single game, but more so about the full season. That in debates, he has lost debates, been humiliated, he says, because other people make an argument that's easier to understand and more simple. But he says that over time, uh, it becomes quite clear that he was, in fact, in the right. And Taleb is um, youngly old, so he's lived some time just that some of the more important ideas of reality cannot be simplified into uh, a format that can be consumed easily through the media sources. This is even a problem that I found 
where I'm trying to spread the truth. That was a TikTok. I popped 800,000 followers plus on TikTok originally and trying to communicate deeply valuable ideas to the masses is nearly impossible, especially when other people are getting much more views talking about how easy it is to sell naked options and such, even though I know that that is inherently um, naive and corrupt. Not corrupt. I mean, it would only be corrupt if they knew, but the sad reality is that they probably aren't exactly aware of reality. Now, he gives an example of how people can twist the information to very quickly um, really manipulate people. He says, go into an airport and ask people how much they would pay for insurance if they were to die um, on this plane crash. Now, not many people are going to pay. And then he said, now go into the airport and ask people how much they would pay for insurance from a terrorist attack on this plane flight. And instantly, right, people are going to be paying more, although it's less broad, less rational, less beneficial because the information was presented in this manner, right, all of a sudden it gets the subconscious in to a uh, tangible reality of risk. He says that this is because our brain goes for superficial clues into risk and probability. I think that I, along with Taleb, as he emphasizes, I trade a lot of options, like end of the, the rabbit hole. And so you start to see in a very realistic, uh, probabilistic perspective. But to the average person, um, they build their risk analysis of how dangerous something is just from, you know, superficial rule of thumby clues and this can be very uh, detrimental to an individual assessing risk but also can be very beneficial to the bad players who are trying to manipulate you and I the marketing department into uh, you know doing something or how they can twist an argument into making it seem falsely right Another example, he says that the market, the stock market's movement um, in the 18 months after September 11, 9-11, um, they were far smaller than the ones that we had faced 18 months before 9-11. But because the investors, the people talking about the market, had some form of causation, these superficial clues, right, to the investor, it seemed like a more volatile marketplace. He said it was partly due to discussion in the media of terrorist effects. And he even says here that um, this is one of the many reasons that journalism may be the greatest plague we face today. As the, as the world becomes more and more complicated and our minds are trained for more and more simplification. Now, when Taleb was writing this, it was the journalists that were the massive distributors of information. But look at how that has shifted. This is why inside of the community I stress this so severely that noise is the enemy and clarity through community is the solution. Being able to see clearly, honestly, through a lot of concepts that Taleb presented is the eternal edge on all of the competition. It was journalists, but consider how severe this is going to get and is getting now that the journalists aren't, they don't, they, it doesn't have to be New York Times telling you something, it just be whoever gets the views. And notice the views are not going to go towards the complex truth to reality. Look at the views of this video and then go look at Graham Stephan's YouTube video, right? That guy over there is going to be getting more views because he curates to the simplification that people desire. And I don't know if, I guess I know too much to do that and feel good about it and sleep well at night. Um, so again, I do appreciate the support because... There's an important message that we're spreading here that is of utmost importance, and I will probably spend my life, the rest of it, uh, singing it to the deaf and painting it for the blind. And you guys really just seeing the support on the last video alone, uh, I appreciate that deeply because getting complex ideas to the public is just such a game. And I've spent really most of my life washing away this dirt that clouds the human endeavor. I mean, of course, I'm blessed, and I, I just, I just like to thank you because it came to mind. <laughs> now he stresses these false narratives that everyone is suffering from, and he reminds himself of Einstein's remark that common sense is nothing but a collection of misconceptions acquired by age 18. Humility is the solution to this barrage of noise that we will be sitting through for the rest of our lives. Humility and perspicacity.
Now he explains that being a risk manager, that people, people who go around to trading firms and basically analyze their risk, he said that it seems like, seemed like a nice job opportunity for him because, well, they make more money than the traders and they don't actually take any risks. But he basically uh, describes a, a moral dilemma where if the risk manager came in there and told all these traders that they were taking risk severely wrong, well, you know, the risk manager wouldn't exactly stay around for long, especially if, like Nero, the risk manager said, hey, we need to lose small sums on a consistent basis. Right? I mean, I even faced this problem talking to traders. Right? A young trader comes in and I can blatantly see that he is building false narratives around what he is doing. Um, and it's a tough position as the educator or uh, the risk analyst to inform somebody on this when they're being paid, right? I, I completely just threw it away. I will tell you straight up. I don't care how it makes you feel. I can't help but just lay the reality out. But understand how complex that would be if your family was relying on you being a risk analyst and you knew everyone was doing wrong, but you needed to be paid at the end of the month. So he says that he wouldn't, didn't take into that. Their focus then turns to become playing politics by getting all these crazy things to sort of make it seem like they're doing something when they're really not. And I mean, I felt this when, if you go through the whole finance route and go learn how to run efficient frontiers or quantify risk and reward to optimize a portfolio weighting uh, to maximize reward and minimize risk, if you go build out the discounted cash flow analysis uh, equations and run the numbers, you start to realize that the market doesn't really care about that. And everyone who's spending time on Wall Street doing that, they can't be exactly after gain, right? They're really just kind of doing it because it seems helpful and serious. Politics. Now he's talking about a Monte Carlo generator, sort of this concept of alternative histories, a mathematical way where you can see different outcomes despite the one that actually took place in reality to get an idea of the risk of ulterior different events taking place. And so the Monte Carlo, which I have one, I will um, actually link it probably inside of this sheet. Um, I mean, it basically just runs many, many trials. Imagine, as he says here, that you could do the Russian roulette thing we talked about earlier um, without you know, killing people or dying yourself. And so uh, you can basically use this random generator to create a bunch of different walks, let's say. And let's say if you made a thousand different walks, considering the bounds that you have set around those walks, you can see the a thousand different uh, potential outcomes of those walks. Now, it's a crazy deep idea. It's not worth getting into, but it's hard to imagine that or even have that as a trusty source of reality because the potential possibilities in reality are truly so complex that you can't exactly build a probability distribution around them. So when you run the Monte Carlo, you basically have to build a, a limit around what could take place inside of those random walks where in reality, you don't have that. And so that's not exactly important, but the Monte Carlo uh, Carlo simulator is a fun tool to help you realize that um, all these different things could take place. And although, um, you know, I won nine trades in a row, that doesn't exactly mean that I'm a safe, good trader. Even if I won 90 trades in a row, right, there still could be a underlying reality where my account gets blown up and I'm a dangerous idiot, as Taleb would say. Now he says that he goes on to talk about these Monte Carlo engines, which I actually spent about half of my year, half a year of my life playing with. Um, but really, the deep, deep theme that is worth understanding is that we can't predict the future. And it's like, uh, it seems simple when I say it, and you're probably on the same page with me. We can't predict the future, and I tell this to traders, and they're like, "Yes, I can't predict the future." They're like, "I'll look you in the eyes. I will promise you, I cannot predict the future." And the next thing you know, right, they're drawing lines on their screen and predicting the future when they can't. But they're like, oh, I won the trade. You're telling me I can't predict the future when I won the trade. Okay. 
but we can't predict the future. Monte Carlo will uh, help you see different trials, different possibilities, but the reality is we can't predict the future. All we control is our position, and what we discussed earlier, that asymmetry, that position that Nero maintained, where you had much more upside reward potential than downside risk potential, and in fact, downside risk was actually capped, right? That is the solution, because no matter what happens, right, you're in a position to gain. You are anti-fragile, as Taleb would put it. And to sum this up, uh, a solution that helps me throughout all of life, I used it originally in trading. It is the question that will decide if you're a profitable trader or not. Um, but all of life, if I made this decision a thousand times, would I come out in profit or in gain? And when you maintain a position of asymmetry and there are no limits on the game, which I don't want to confuse you with, uh, the answer is, is yes. But in just about every other scenario, the answer is no. Now he gives an example of how we can't exactly learn from history itself. If you want to learn hard lessons the easy way, you know, reading history books isn't exactly going to do it. He emphasizes that we were created to learn from reality. And he used an example of a dementia patient whom uh, the caretaker had to introduce himself to the dementia patient just about every 15 20 minutes just to make sure that they she knew that she could trust him and that they were safe and he tested something by going in one day and shaking her with a pin on his hand that basically zapped her and so he shook her hand and she got zapped and then the day went through he came back in the next day she did not know his name but still when he went out to shake her hand she pulled her hand away you see that disconnect between that deep physical comprehension of reality and what the mind thinks it knows. He emphasizes that that's how you need to learn um, history or lessons, right, is through reality. Very deep idea. Just love this man, bro. Page 55 here, he emphasizes um, on predicting past history, or the point that we don't exactly learn very well from being in history. Uh, an example he gives is of people in the 1929 market crash. Uh, you know, at the time, they did not know that the market was crashing, or they didn't know at the time that this was some acute, extremely crazy event in history. He says that life is kind of made out to resemble some adventure movie where before the event happens, you, you hear the suspenseful music come in and you know something crazy is going to take place but it is truly far from that. Now he's emphasizing something he terms hindsight bias, how these big events always seem extremely obvious after the fact. Uh, and it's kind of the issue we just discussed about life being an adventure movie, which almost builds that false narrative further, where after the fact, looking back, it seems like the financial crisis was obvious. All these guys were selling this debt for like that. You know what I mean? Um, he says, imagine taking a, or taking a test and knowing all the answers on the test, right? It's extremely obvious because there's only one observation when looking backwards of what took place. Whereas when you're in the moment, just as the next couple of words I say, there are infinite possibilities as to what could possibly come out of my mouth next. Right? But looking back after you've watched it, oh, well, it seems pretty obvious as to what I was about to say. Crazy, bro. This guy's so good, bro. Now he's giving an idea, which this whole book is all about, is separating the noise from the signal, as we say, or true information, things that will leave you more informed versus all the clutter, which is becoming more and more clear as we live. And one way he emphasizes to do this with an example of the books by his bedside, which he emphasizes are old, old books, because as time goes on, this noise kind of increases, and uh, a book that has lasted the test of time, or a book that is hundreds, if not thousands of years old, well, mathematically, it has won, right? Mathematically, it, it has maintained a clear signal that is still, still applicable. And that's why I always emphasize to read old books, which I said we're reading Alex Hermosi's $100 million leads, 
uh, in the video I posted before this one. I normally I only read old books um, for this reason, thanks to Taleb enlightening me. But again, Taleb, not exactly an old book. Nonetheless, it is extremely uh, clear that one of the best tools to see the signal through the noise is time, right? The new, what is uh, coming out today is going to be replaced by more new. Okay? The rule of thumb is that if it's been here for 100 years, we can safely predict that it will be here and valid for another 100 years. 1,000 years, 1,000 years. One year, one year. What is new will be replaced by something more new, and time tests a concept's credentials. With this idea, he's also been interweaving the danger of journalists the fact that they are not equipped to interpret this data themselves, let alone communicate data to the public. And so especially the market, people talking about the market, you can see a Jim Cramer, whoever you want to reference, they're up there spitting noise. <laughs> Taleb makes it extremely clear that what is new will be replaced by something more new. And them talking about intraday market movements is is basically talking about how the wind's been blowing for the last minute, right? It's utterly insignificant, right? The tornado is the event uh, worth discussing. And also ties to the problem we discussed with the risk management guy, where the journalists can't exactly downplay it, right? It's part of the entire game. They got to feed their families too. The journalists couldn't say the market's up 1% today, but this is rather insignificant considering the last three months of price, right? They would be fired. And so it's a, a mess, truly, that will be here and growing for the next um, 10 years, a uh, million years, <laughs> really, as long as information is being spread how it is. And I think that the negative black swan that is going to have a disproportionate effect on reality is quite literally this uh, foolishness around randomness and the human's failure to interpret um, reality. And hence, uh, the structure of my community is built around clarity through community. Noise is the enemy. He emphasizes, for instance, the newspaper listing a dozen different innovations that will revolutionize our lives and that right there right the focus on the old uh, you know people counter argument that with well what if you miss the new piece of innovation that will revolutionize our lives uh, he emphasizes that he believes the opposite view that there is much more opportunity cost in uh that there is much more benefit to avoiding all the garbage that is shoved down our throats than seeing that they made a new plane or a new Apple Watch that's going to maybe help your life very slightly, arguably none, not at all though. So uh, it's almost risky to look for the new things because you have to sit around in garbage all day wastefully thinking about noisy derivatives. How he gives a paradoxical example of someone getting lost in the noise. Um, basically, Schiller, who I believe claimed the market had to be theoretically efficient, meaning there's no true profit potential. Money would never be handed out on a silver platter in the market. Um, and this man, Robert C. Merton, who supported this um, argument, basically saying the market was efficient, who later founded a hedge fund, um, quite literally, in pursuit of exploiting market inefficiencies. Therefore, made an argument that the market was efficient and then built a fund asking people for money to exploit something he said that was not present. And then what makes the fact that the market is not efficient of utmost clarity is that uh, his fund went bust due to the black swan problem, <laughs> which is just so gruesomely paradoxical. And this can get complicated, but uh, uh, I assure you that we have a very narrow, clear perspective on it inside the community, the most clear perspective I've ever seen on a lot of the ideas that he is uh, discussing here. Now he says that there are a lot of good journalists. This doesn't mean all journalists um, are fools of randomness. He suggests London's Anatoly Kaletsky uh, and New York's Jim Grant and Alan Abelson as the under, um, underrated representatives of good information. We got to change a battery.
I was going into a lot of math to explain the difference between noise and signal, or noise and true inf informational meaning, something that is real. And he's using the Monte Carlo simulator, which runs the 1,000 random walks uh, to help us get an intuition for these things. Um, but what is very similar is an ideology, that which is quite literally what the Monte, simulator, Monte Carlo simulator does, is if you did this a thousand times, or if you acted on that information a thousand times, would it be profitable? Would it still hold true? You can't think about one narrow perspective on things. You can't think about one example from history when it worked, right? Because I could tell you a million great things about Apple stock, but that does not mean that it's gonna make you money by buying it, right? I could show you, and they'll show you on the internet, Forex traders that made money, but that does not mean that you're gonna make money forex trading, right? You have to think about the broad scope, all the different alternative possibilities of coursing through these actions and what is going to maximize your probability of being successful in that. Or uh, for instance, in regards of information, what pieces of information aren't some noisy derivative built off of a singular event in history and what pieces of information will stand the test of time and actually represent the reality no matter if it's one take or 10,000 takes. Now he separates this noise from the signal in a very scientific manner, right? My job is not to give you the science. I highly recommend picking up anything this man has ever written. Uh, but my job more so is to communicate it to you. And he basically draws a line in deductive and inductive. Whereas deductive logic would be like two plus two equals four. Where everything inside of that logical statement has defined limits. Um, and axioms, like there's no uh, noisy middle ground, right? Two plus two equals four, and that's an argument. And then there's another argument which is inductive, that's verified not by uh, definable limits, but by some experience, some uh, statistics. For instance, in Spain, it rains. And he's emphasizing that whenever you're making an inductive argument and you're verifying it by uh, experience statistics, um, it's very easy to get fooled by randomness if you cannot interpret that uh, evidence properly. Now it gives an example of how academics can just use all this verbiage that makes it seem like they're saying something, but they're not really saying anything. A lot of my times on my Twitter, long gamma, L-O-O-N-G-G-A-M-M-A -M -M on X, Twitter, I will uh, kind of poke at this and make fun of this with other people. Like Jim Cramer's tweets, half of them are saying nothing. And he gives an example of this by using the, Monte, the randomness Monte Carlo simulator to make uh, a few lines or like an essay. And it mimics the academics very well. I mean, what I'm reading to you here, it is his example that is completely nothing, a void of nothingness. But watch how I read it. You'll probably think I'm saying something cool. However, the main theme of the works of Rudishi is not theory, as the dialectic paradigm of reality suggests, but pre-theory. The premise of the neosmenatic paradigm of discourse implies that sexual identity, ironically, has significance. <laughs> Boy or girl? Many narratives concerning the role of the writer as observer may be revealed. It could be said that if cultural narrative holds, we have to choose between the dialectic paradigm of narrative and neoconceptual Marxism. Satire's analysis of cultural narrative holds that society paradoxically has objective value. He said, boy or girl matters, society matters. Thus, the premise of the neo-dialectical paradigm of expression implies that consciousness may be used to reinforce hierarchy, but only if reality is distinct from consciousness. If that is not the case, we can assume that language has intrinsic meaning. Literally nothing was said there. I said nothing. He said nothing. There was nothing said there, but if I got the right room of academics, they would probably come ask for my autograph after that. They'd probably come ask me some questions, which is very important to understand because uh, a scapegoat 
that a lot of people use in this intellectual game. I met a guy who sold a volatility index um, strategy. This is actually a fine example of this. I met a man who sold a volatility index strategy to JP Morgan. Okay, and I was talking to him about the VIX. I know some things about the VIX, right? The VIX is purely derived from the implied volatility or the, the trading, the demand for the option chain. And basically, I just didn't see how he had an edge. I was asking him a million questions and he was just not getting anywhere. And then I asked him to recommend me a book and he recommended me a book which I speak on a lot of the time, but it's about um, foreign exchange it's about the complexities of foreign exchange and the entire book is building false narratives that we're importing, exporting out too much and because of this, it is causing economic distraught inside and it is just uh, an intellectual shit show, right? 99% of people uneducated would be like, wow, this guy's smart. He knows something I don't know. I looked at that. There was nothing inside that book. It was filled with this, what I had just read to you. And it's a deep, deep thing to understand. Um, Taleb helped me realize that I, I thought I dropped out of school and was trying to chase the academics, like trying to catch up to the people with the degrees, the guys running the efficient frontiers. And I tell you what, I caught up to them. I spent a lot of time, a lot of my younger years, catching up to them, sitting in a room all day, learning about derivative, learning how to build an efficient frontier. I built my own DCF, they're all in the community. But there is no gain there. There's no point there. There's not even a reason to even be talking about that stuff because it doesn't lead to any gain. It's a noise field, a complexity that they hold above the general population's head to oppress you into getting a degree and chasing that academic route. And most of the time, you're so lost down a rabbit hole, you can't even see that this rabbit hole is leading to nowhere. Um, so don't let people try to outnoise you, okay? This will help you see that noise is the devil and those people lost it and no matter how big of words they can say, they're quite foolish. <sighs> That's crazy. Just hearing that come out of my mouth is just, I don't even know what to say about it to be honest. And Taleb here, he terms them pseudo thinkers. And he's continuing to give more examples of pseudo thinkers, people who just talk all this stuff. I mean, there's famous people who talk all this stuff who you take a look at what they're saying. Uh, there's not much there that they are. Now, Taleb goes on to say that although we have just rationalized half of reality and he does kind of align with these um, no nonsense realists, um, he acknowledges like a beauty in the randomness of poetry and he even notes over rationally as he would that the biology of man kind of leaves something in there that uh, sees the beauty in those things and that's uh, just a beautiful idea that you know you can rationalize so much stuff but the art um, of all things is still worth deeply appreciating and uh, poetry is a fine example he says where like a lot of poetry, you know what I mean? Are they really saying anything? But there's still an artistic value to that. Though, I don't think we should look at this pseudo-thinker thing um, as a realist value or a tangible utility to get us closer to our goals or move the needle, but on an artistic entertainment front, um, there is some value there. And he goes on to emphasize in this contrast of uh, utilitary information, information that will move you close to your goals or actually help you versus um, bad information that it's almost dangerous to completely subtract all of this um, noise. He uses poetry as an example that, you know, it, words can bring like a solace, like a pleasure to the human mind and uh, just subtracting it and using it as like kind of an equation and minimizing all the um, flavor in language to the signal is um, not the point he's trying to make here but more so when needed you need to be able to see clearly through the noise and when uh, needed you need to be able to enjoy some of the noise or some poetry right something that's not exactly clear clear signal Well, we've been sitting here for like three hours, maybe four. Time to be like, take a little walk, you know what I mean? Walk and read, walk and read.
So now he's giving an example of a trader he knew named Carlos, who did extremely well. He was buying bonds every time the market had a fake crash in 1995 um, due to the Mexican devaluation. He would just buy the dips and he was doing well. Um, he said he ended up making $80 million cumulatively for the firm in his previous years, yet just this one bad quarter, this bad summer, he had lost $300 million. When the market started dipping in June, his information, his fundamental analysis that treated him so well for oh so long, it didn't fall through. Only once, only once it took, it did not fall through, and he lost uh, five times the amount that he had ever made. <laughs> he went bust. And now he's going to talk a bit about averaging down, which is a nice conversation. Now he's emphasizing that in this example, the market was going against him, but Carlos had spent the last 20 years of his life buying dips and it worked. And he kept emphasizing that the market kept going through the lines he had drawn in the sand, that this was the bottom, this was the bottom. And he kept coming in and saying, only if investors realize and start investing now, they could really make some serious returns. But the market kept falling. He kept buying value, but the market kept falling. He kept buying fundamentally sound stuff. The market kept falling. And the Russian bonds did not stop falling. I mean, if you look at the Russian currency, you can assume some terrible things have taken place uh, <laughs> in that economy. Um, I wonder if communism had something to do with it. Um, but now Carlos is out of the market. He was being escorted out by a security guard. And uh, it doesn't mean that he's a bad trader, right? Understand, he had years of success. He was a good trader but that doesn't matter when you're picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, you see. He goes, into, he goes into parallel this right back to John the High Yield Trader, which we started the video with. He says that just as in a biblical cycle, it took seven years to make John a hero and just seven days to make him a failure. Again, all of this is completely from one single source, Life examples of traders, I mean, this applies everywhere in life, though, losing everything oh so quickly because they didn't understand that they're building false narratives on theory rather than reality. And the reality is that if your asymmetry, if your position on any plane of anything has more downside risk than upside reward potential, that downside risk is going to come, especially if you have this much reward potential, even if you win 99% of the time. That downside risk that's theoretically infinite when you're selling calls, when you're mountain climbing, uh, if you run enough trials, that is inevitably going to present itself. Now here is a list of things to watch very, very closely to notice a trader like this, which is a majority of traders. But it starts with a tendency to get married to positions, right? Uh, he says bad traders divorce their spouse sooner than abandon their positions. All right, <laughs> you better figure out why this guy is talking about this position so uh, seriously. Has he just built a narrative that he is attached to it, that it is going to be okay through theory, right? Is he actually assessing reality? It doesn't matter what position it is. I bought micro cap hims and hers, and I, you have to be completely aware of the fact that no matter how many, I mean, the company sells drugs on the internet, but no matter how good sound the company's business model is, it could still go to zero tomorrow, right? And so your positioning should also always be in consideration of this, and getting married to positions is naive. Understand that uh, a position is a girlfriend, not a wife, right? You need to cut that chick and move on a lot of the time. Next, the tendency to change their story, right? This was the bottom and then it falls through and then all of a sudden technical analysis is showing why that wasn't the bottom. Is, is that the case, right? You could build all these false narratives and I mean, I've seen it for so long, I could false narrative to an insane degree, you know? There's a million different false things you could put as to the reasoning why what you said didn't happen. But is that the reason why what you said didn't happen or is the reason why what you said didn't happen because you don't understand reality and you're building false narratives with academics and theory? 
Another one is no precise game plan ahead of time as to do in the event of loss. For instance, when I'm buying a micro cap, my idea, my game plan is that this could go to zero. I'm going to position accordingly. I think that there's, right, it could only go to zero, but it could do a thousand percent. And that's really what I'm after, that asymmetry precisely. Um, but if you don't have a game plan, if someone doesn't have a game plan as to what happens if that position goes to zero, it's probably because they have a false narrative around the fact that it can't go to zero when it definitely can. And then he says basically denial. Like there will just be denial. They will refuse to sell. They will continue to bag hold and continue waking up and hoping they can come up with something cool enough to fool themselves into thinking that everything is okay rather than biting reality and, you know, moving on. And so now he's talking about evolution, which is a deep, deep idea I hope I can communicate. Uh, with these false narratives that um, Darwinism or this natural selection process is ever optimizing towards an optimal reality, which to a general sense it is, but it's never perfect. And he's basically um, emphasizing that uh, on average animals will be fit. It does not mean that every single one of them is going to be fit and definitely not at all times. So he emphasizes that evolution takes place in jumps. Uh, a weird, like for instance, a pug, I think is a fine example. Some weird little animal could win, not because it's optimal for reality, but because it has like a little survivorship bias and it has not come in contact and experienced a super extreme rare event, right? So these little nooks and crannies can happen and take place for many, many years. And it can take a long time for a serious extreme enough event to come in and re-optimize uh, nature, I suppose, through a Darwin sort of idea. You know, for instance, if an apocalypse happened, um, the pugs would not <laughs> live for long, but the, you know, the uh, German shepherds would probably still be out there, um, honestly, taking on the wolves pretty well. Maybe. <laughs> Now he's starting to talk about bullish and bearish. These words that are often used in finance markets, by bullish you think the market's gonna go up, by bearish you think the market's gonna go down. And even they're used in real life where if you're bullish on me, um, you know, you think I'm gonna rise in value. If you're bearish on the incomprehensible slanky kid walking around his house reading this crazy book, then you think I'm gonna deteriorate in value. And I've shared this story many times, one of my favorite stories, because it really shows the reality, a deeper understanding most sadly won't ever really um, come to. But uh, he gives a story of him inside of like a big Wall Street um, sort of thing where they're all talking about the market. There's a bunch of intellects in the room and he basically goes up there and he gives a ton of reasons why the market's going to go up. And then when it comes down to his positioning, he's bearish, right? And like there's a 70% chance that the market's going to go up, then Taleb, why are you bearish, right? And it's because there are underlying variables here, okay? Yes, it's 75% chance the market's going to go up, but how up, right? There's a 30% chance the market's going to go down, but how down, right? How down could make that 30% well more worth the 70% chance it goes to the upside, you see? That's hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around, but if you do see, I mean, I'm trading live um, most mornings. And I mean, I'm really just positioning and hoping I catch a swan in my net, uh, but I abide by this logic a lot of the time. I'll give you a million reasons why the market's gonna go up. It doesn't mean I'm gonna be betting bullish because the profit is where the profit is. I don't pick that. And a lot of the times, if everyone thinks the market's gonna go up, the profit is undoubtedly to the downside, right? He's going on to give many, many more examples of this. Um, for instance, he's giving an example of a statement from a man named Jim Rogers, which is, from my perspective, just insanely naive, and I'll show you why. He says, I don't buy options. Buying options is another way to go to the poorhouse. 
Someone did a study for the SEC and discovered that 90% of all options expire as losses. Well, I figured out that if 90% of all loss op long option positions lost money, that meant that 90% of all short option positions made money. If I want to use options to be bearish, I sell calls. Now, this is like the whole book in a summer. Like, he just built a narrative off this data that he threw. So he's saying that 90% of option trades go to zero, which is fair. It's probably more than that, right? And so he's like, okay, so I'm just going to go sell them. Okay. But the, the issue is that the 10% that don't go to zero will harm him far more than he will make from the 90% that do go to zero when selling those options. And so it's all this shit show of... Uh, falsely interpreting data. And even Taleb talks about how he trades options. He says he is positioning for the improbable event that doesn't happen often. Um, now, that's what I do, not, not because Taleb says so, but if you look at the map, I break it down in the most simplistic way I've ever seen it inside of my Discord. But if you just look at how reality functions, the profit, the only time that the market is severely outside of its equilibrium that it maintains, is in that unprobable extreme event that no one thought of. Because any time that there's limits, we can predict everything inside of that game. Sports gambling doesn't work, okay? But options, when I can buy a call option and my max profit is theoretically infinite, my max loss is 100, right? Uh, they can't quantify the odds of infinite happening, right? Not infinite, but they can't quantify the odds of the insanely unthinkable taking place. It's outside the domain of what we can think of anyways. They're falsely interpreting data on a severe level. And a lot of people, big money Wall Street guys, I'm still the 2020, 22-year-old naive idiot that doesn't know reality. But they are playing in these noisy facades. Anyone selling options, their whole asymmetry is upside down, yet they can bloat about it every day on social media because they're making money every day. But none of those pennies that they pick up every day are going to be worth a single thing when the steamroller runs them over, right? None of that food that the turkey ate is going to be worth anything when Thanksgiving Day comes. See, and it's hard to see for the average person, but if you can see it, you're just light years ahead of uh, the competition. Now he says in a lot of places, the, the asymmetry that we just discussed there, of more upside gain than loss and how selling options, your asymmetry is upside down. A lot of the time, it does not matter. And that's in like binary pass or tail fa or fail tests, um, really anything with limits where your loss can't be unknown. He goes off with like a frustrating, which I felt before, where he's explaining to um, basically people trading this Mexican pace. So they basically realize that their theoretical financial instruments were not predicting the Mexican peso. It was doing unthinkable things. How possibly could this be the case? Because it's a game of reality and there are no limits. But anyway, so he explained to them why this was the case. And they're like, 100%, 100%, we agree with you, 100%. Everything makes sense. But we don't, we don't trade the, the Mexican peso. We trade the Russian ruble. Right, that narrow vision of not understanding how deep uh, these themes run uh, led to them blowing up their account uh, shortly after trading the Russian ruble. Right, this is very, very deep stuff. Now he flips this on its head in regards of taking the other side of the game where your asymmetry is you know, you're taking consistent small risks for a massive potential gain. Uh, in our asymmetry list in the community, we have a list of these positions because they're the secret to the universe. Um, but he gives an example of so, some scientist studying on mice. And he could spend years tinkering away onto this mice and, you know, trying to find a, a cure to, let's say, cancer, for instance. And, you know, he keeps going and everyone from looking at the time series, they're like, he has made no gain. Uh, even his spouse could get tired of him, you know, give up on him. And he's still tinkering away. And then the day that he actually gets the breakthrough, right, and actually finds some sort of cure, right, when you look back on it and put it in terms of, like, improbability, it makes it seem like every day he's, like, getting closer um, to the situation. Understanding that will understand, will help you see 
the value in taking small risks on a consistent basis, but also help you understand that uh, every event is an individual event. Um, and honestly, Taleb is very wordy, beautiful, beautiful book that enlightened me. But if you do want a clearer perspective on every deeply valuable idea that I've seen in all of his books, um, my community applies reality. And we have drawn lines in reality that um, I'm working on communicating, but are from my, from what I've seen, unseen. Like it, no one else has done this, what we're doing in our community. Like it's, I'm taking a risk even by just promoting my community, just like the scientists. I'm building out this product to help give a framework of reality. A lot of it came from uh, the beauty that Taleb shared with me at an extremely young age. And over the years, I haven't reread the books, but they've been developing in my mind and I've been observing reality and drawing lines, a f optimal framework of reality so we don't get caught in these problems of this guy made million dollar off crypto, he must know something genius. Uh, but the reality is he didn't make a million dollars off crypto because he studied crypto. It was the position that allowed him to do so. It was luck and it's only gonna be luck until you understand that luck is fake and positioning is real. I will continue to get better at communicating. If you're here in this part of the video, you're a killer, brother. You're an assassin, bro. Keep, keep hustling, just trust the process. Just like this man studying on the rat, bro. It'll break through, keep hammering away. If you chip at the wall every day, the diamonds will flow through eventually, I promise you. Especially if you keep your downside risk up. You know? And he's basic. He's now emphasizing um, why we can't detect rare events. Why we build our false narratives around the unprobable not happening over the years. And he gives an example of um, if there's like a crate of black balls. Let's say there's thousands of black balls and there was a couple red balls in this crate. If you kept picking every day a ball from that crate and it was black, 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 black. Every time the ball is black. You know, every day you're kind of starting to build a narrative around the fact that there is no red ball. Like there's no red ball, right? There must not be a red ball. There really must not be a red ball. But every day you're picking the ball. Every day that you spend picking those balls, your probability is accumulating of the odds of you actually selecting the red ball. And the same thing It's back to the turkey situation. Turkey's built a narrative that that man is not there to slaughter him because he doesn't know what slaughter is, never seen it before, but instead feed him. And those pennies I'm picking up off the ground are not dangerous. They're pennies. Oh, the steamroller, right? Beautiful stuff to let, keep it up. Let's, let's, let's wrap it up. Wrap up part one. Now he goes on to talk on a statistical arbitrager, which basically means they find little anomalies, little things that are very, very correlated in markets, and they will sort of exploit the difference of them. For instance, um, if this sports gambling website is offering a, a certain plus 40 spread on a trade or a bet, basically like a... Michael Irvin's gonna throw this touchdown, plus 40. And this guy's offering plus 20 on the same bet. Well, through the difference between those, those different skews, you could basically arbitrage it or exploit the difference. Another example would be um, Airbnb arbitrage, which is something, um, a common model, even drop shipping is the same thing, where the price you are getting the product or service from um, is cheaper relative to the price that you can sell it somewhere else at almost instantaneously. So I get the rental for a thousand bucks a month, put on Airbnb, make 1500 bucks a month off at $500 of income and margin. And so he's talking about this statistical arbitrage and how we, um, I believe, have this dogma that any testable statement, any claim someone makes that is testable should be tested. And Taleb says it's not practiced very commonly, but uh, it should be. And so he gives an example of a statement that is easily um, lost due to randomness. And this statement is that um, automobile accidents happen closer to home. And so if you look and build like a 10 mile radius around 
people's homes, you will see that it is more probable that automobile accidents happen near someone's home. And is that because it's more dangerous to drive near your home? It's not the case. Right? What's the other variable? Why would automobile accidents happen more often near the home if it's not more dangerous to drive near your home? It's because you spend more time driving near your home. You have more exposure to automobile accidents where you drive more often and you happen to drive more often near your home. Now he says that there is a much more severe aspect, he calls this naive empiricism, uh, which empirical, you look it up, that is basically the idea of like extremely significant uh, analysis from reality, not from theory. Um, and so basically it means like all this stuff, like real, real. Um, and so here's a one he says, the market never goes down 20% in a given three month period. And maybe you can look back and, and find this to be the case that the market has not gone down 20% um, in a given three month period, but it's dangerous to even assume that. It's literally the turkey problem to come to that conclusion that if, well, if I can take a 20% drop, I'll be fine because the history is not a projection of the future. The history is simply what has taken place, right? And so the unthinkable can happen. That's kind of the whole problem is that you wouldn't want to um, come to a conclusion, a positive conclusion off of some naive data like this. And in fact, it's much, much easier to reject it um, off of data than approve it. Subtractive knowledge, deep idea that we probably won't get into, but the community does in on learning. Yeah, he says he can, he can quantitate, like there's things that have dropped obviously over 20% in a three month period. But even then, like it doesn't even matter, just the, the turkey problem that we explained, that he explains somewhere in one of these, um, is why you couldn't come to that conclusion. And another fine example of flipping this on its head, which he calls later subtractive knowledge, is that uh, Statement A, no swan is black because I looked at 4,000 swans and I found none. Right? That's not an assumption you can make. You can't say that no swans are black because you looked at 5,000 swans and none of the swans were black. They were all white. What you can say is that not all swans are white. Right? That's a much more firm conclusion to come to from, you see what I mean? Subtractive knowledge. You cannot logically make that first statement no matter how many white swans you see, right? There's still potential for a swan to be black. But the second you see one black swan, you can instantly draw the line and say not all swans are white. And that idea is so insanely deep, right? We'll give a, just some examples here. You can make 500 trades. You say this trading strategy is profitable, right? But the second that I see that your downside risk potential is so significant that it could erase all of your gain potential, I can instantly say that is not a rational trading strategy. You see, from one single data point, I can make this conclusion. And for instance, large cap stocks make people money. This is what everyone says, Apple stock makes people money. I buy large cap stocks, it makes people money. But I see one data point, which is the fact that mutual funds, hedge funds on average, do not beat the market. I can instantly confirm that Large cap stocks actually, in opportunity costs, lose people money, right? And I can draw that line through subtractive knowledge rather than affirmative knowledge. And you'll see in marketing, especially like all the noise that fools people with randomness, you could tell you a million <laughs> different reasons why something's good for you. Oh, this supplement does this, this supplement does this, this supplement will help you see better. But who knows what the supplement's going to do to your eyes in 30 years? The negative effects could easily outweigh the short-term positive effects. Therefore, that supplement is not rational to take, taking steroids. I'll tell you 10, oh, you make your biceps big, you'll put on muscle mass, you'll be stronger. If an apocalypse happened, you could probably kick more ass off steroids, but your wiener stops working, your hair goes away, and you die at 65, right? I can instantly confirm that taking steroids is not a rational decision because 
I am no longer a fool of randomness. And he says a funny one. He says, I have just completed a thorough statistical examination of the life of President Bush for 58 years, close to 21,000 observations, and he did not die once. I can hence pronounce him as immortal with a high degree of statistical significance. We just pronounced Bush as immortal. High degree of statistical significance. 21,000 observations. He did not die once. You see that? I hope you can. It's very valuable if you do. And if you do, please join my community. We can do great things together. Now he's putting big praise on an author by the name of Popper who he originally had a bad idea around, um, but then he came to acknowledge that he was a no-nonsense individual. And oftentimes one of the best places to get books is by finding an author you trust, and then when he recommends some author or talks highly of him, buy that book. Hence my Seneca, Stoic, Marcus Aurelius stuff all came from other books of authors that were intelligent, a lot to lead, who referenced them. Now he goes on with like this problem of induction, which is quite complicated to communicate. Um, but I think a nice thing we can carry with us is this fact that theory is never right, which Taleb emphasizes that theory will never be right, solely right, right? There is an unthinkable randomness that runs the, like, there is always going to be something unthinkable which can take place. He basically says that we will never know that all swans are white. You see, of course, we know that there is such thing as a black swan, and it's possible, but we could still we could spend the rest of our life counting white swans. We still will never actually know that all swans are white. It's the same thing with all things, right? We never actually know that this trading strategy is a great strategy or this anomaly will always be here. And the real solution that Taleb communicates is the asymmetry and simply being in a position uh, to gain from whatever may take place in more specifically, not lose from whatever the reality may be. He emphasizes Popper's idea of an open society, which that no permanent truth or no truth can really be held to exist. Um, now, these are extremely deep ideas. He praises them for quite some time and then even says um, some sobering information that nobody is perfect. He talks about some um, ugly things of Popper. Um, but nonetheless, I think that this first part of the book, oh, we got a couple more, we got a couple more data points for us. And so he gives an example of a, an intellectual asymmetry where, uh, for instance, he calls like Pascal's wager. He says that believing in God, it, it would be smart to believe in God because if God exists, um, the believer would benefit. And if God does not exist, the believer would not lose anything. And so this is what we basically just said. And the solution, as Taleb presents, um, really is this asymmetry on all planes of the human endeavor. Now, he doesn't quite communicate it like that. Um, but in order to communicate it myself to anyone, really, I think that's the best way to uh, present it. Um, and in regards of information, the, the mind is more... Um, created to remember things in uh, like uh, logical links. This happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And so the induction thing is like, what first happened? Like what, what is the, the spawner of such happenings? And there's no answer to that, right? It's the God randomness. Um, but the human brain is kind of built to memorize things through logical links. The World War II happened because of this. Um, my portfolio blew up because of this, because of this. Um, it wasn't my positioning. It was because the Fed did rate cuts and they didn't tell anyone about it. Now I'm pissed about it. That's the only reason why I lost money. There's no possible other reason. Right? And so in conclusion of part one of Fooled by Randomness, um, there is a noise which is spread throughout reality um, 
from a failure to be able to interpret data, which as we've seen is not the most simple thing to do, especially for the average individual. Um, asymmetry was presented as a gorgeous solution to many, many issues. And I mean, it's just such a dense, beautiful book. Of course, I did my best in communicating it to you because I know that a majority of individuals will never actually pick up the book. But this is a beautiful thing along with this other ones. Um, we're going to stop here actually at part one just so I get a gauge. Let me know if uh, we should do the part two. And let me honestly recommend books below. I'll be happy to rip through anything. I mean, this is one of the more complex books. I chose it out of pure selection because I thought um, that it would benefit more the most people truly who could actually grasp these ideas because I know that for the last six years um, ideas like this are what have stuck in with me through all the noise that I've seen and I feel given me a, a straight narrow path towards an optimal finish line right um, and it helps you realize the reality of things um, it helps you not be discouraged, you know, just like at the start when you saw Nero and John and John's over here leveling it up, bro. I've seen that in real time, like the crypto flush. Well, I sat down and said, I'm not selling NFTs. That's fraudulent. I had a TikTok with 800,000 followers. I'm not pumping that shit coin. That's fraudulent. And it's super hard to watch everyone leave you and go make millions of dollars and know deep down that what you are after is what is best and is what is right. Um, but a book like this will help you see that I thank the Lord that I even found education as enlightening as this at such a young age because it propelled me on a, a trajectory of not even extreme success, but an optimal realistic success, you know, not lost in facades that most humans are subject to, but a framework of reality that I can operate in that doesn't allow me to be sucked down the labyrinths from marketing departments and spend millions of dollars, <laughs> I say millions of dollars, but really what's more important, time building DCFs, doing all these crazy valuation methods when I have a framework of reality and how to optimally move forward. And a lot of time it's through asymmetry. I know that what we just discussed here can be quite complex, um, but I hope I can simplify um, a lot of the ideas, the valuable ones as we do with each book that we read and I have read is I kind of bring the signals to the community so we can apply them in our day-to-day -day life um, to gain. I appreciate all the support. It really helps. Do me a favor. The more you smash that subscribe button every time I get a little shot of dopamine in my brain when you hit the subscribe button, <laughs> when you hit the like, the comments, bro, shout out the lads in the comments. The last one just gave me clarity that what I was doing here was worth my five hours of sitting down and reading a book and then chopping it up for y'all. Um, and I just really, I appreciate community, man. So any, any um, support or participation in what we're trying to do over here at AE Education, um, I do deeply appreciate. And we never really read novels because there's no point to reading novels. But I just want to end it off with a recommendation of some novels because there's a lot of informational text that we can get uh, lost in in life and a lot of time can be spent looking at informational texts and I'll never read probably a novel right because there's such a deep intrinsic value you get through like an osmosis of living the realities of these novels um, that will just shape you into just such a capable competent individual I highly recommend it and it's a lot easier on the brain you can read a novel and really enjoy it bro every time i read taleb like <laughs> the neurons are firing uncontrollable if i read this thing any of these before bed i'm not sleeping but these are, are much nicer it's far better for your brain than a netflix series i promise you the count of monte cristo just beautifully brilliant i can't get across how much value is inside of this book bro you live a full life if you read this thing it looks big but it becomes very short pretty quick once you start getting intertwined into the storyline. I mean, everything Dostoevsky is just a beautiful thing. I haven't even read this one, The Idiot, but I've heard great things. Um, Crime and Punishment, I have read. Great, great book. Brothers of Kazmarov, I have read. I liked Crime and Punishment better, but I know there's some argument about that. The Double and the Gambler, highly recommend uh, The Gambler. And The Double, um, if you want a book, it's called, I'm going to have to find it. Uh, yeah, no, I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, another great novel, a lot of philosophy inside of this one, kind of heavy. This one will make your brain explode too. Um, haven't read that one. Highly recommend this one. Uh, intelligence is a much easier read, much more common in like the general public. 
Um, and then if you're a market nerd and really want to see these probabilities things very well, before I read anything more complicated, I read this, A Man for All Market. It's beautiful story of Edward Thorpe. I'm an options trader because the asymmetry is there. It's literally genius. But he first beat casinos and then he went on to the options market. And it's all about understanding probability. But it's through a pleasantly uh, entertaining story of Edward Thorpe, who is just a brilliant man. Uh, but with that said, I appreciate you all for tuning in. Stay blessed, stay disciplined, stay rational, stay stoic, lads. And I hope to see you inside of the community discord at gg stocks. Catch you, lads.